I saw a blog post yesterday by a man called Larmy Hirsch about the historical world accounts of the crucifixion's darkness. So I'm just going to share you um, this, this blog post because I thought it was really, really interesting, uh, especially to see how different cultures experienced that moment when Christ died, when the earth shook, when, you know, the, the eclipse of the earth, which is a historical record. Um, which has been noted by many people around the world at that time. So I'll just take you through this and uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Take care. Bye-bye. Historical World Accounts of the Crucifixion's Darkness uh, April 1st, 2021 by Lermi Harsh Long ago in ancient Peru, there was a legend of a time of worldwide darkness. It is said the sun had gone for five days. Stones knocked against one another. Shepherds were attacked by their own sheep, whether they were running away in the fields or hiding in their homes. Even the mortars and pestles, grinders and their bowls are said to have rebelled against their owners. Another Peruvian story, it is said that there are that there was a people before the Incans. These ancient people experienced a period without sun, so they prayed until the sun finally rose from Lake Titicaca, and in a midday a white man who carried great authority came into the land. He is said to have turned hills into plains and vice versa. Mountains sprang from the very stones. He was a man to be venerated, and those ancient people regarded him as the maker of everything. The first tale originates from the who who wrote cheery manuscript by a cleric named Francisco de Avila and the second tale stems from El Señorío de los Incos, Incas from the second part of the Chronicle of Peru recorded by Pedro uh, Cieza de León. Both stories are said to be in an account of the day Jesus Christ died and the world turned to darkness. There are also records of this mysterious worldwide darkness on the other side of the world. In ancient China, at approximately the time that, that Jesus Christ would have been crucified, Chinese astronomical reports tell the following. Summer, fourth month of the year, on the day of Ren Wu, the imperial edict reads, Yin and Yan were mistakenly switched, and the sun and the moon were eclipsed. The sins of all the people are now on one man. Pardon is proclaimed to all under heaven. History of Latter Han Dynasty, Volume 1, Chronicles of Emperor Guangwu, 7th year. And also, Eclipse on the day of Guihai, Man from Heaven died. History of Latter Han Annals, number 18, Guihai. While these records state that this was an eclipse event, it is not unreasonable to consider that the Han were mistaken about the darkness cause. After all, the Chinese were very astronomically minded people in those days, and it would seem natural to pin the blame of such an event on something they were familiar with, an eclipse, whether there was one or not. Also, it's worth adding that it is popularly held notion that three days after this event, a rainbow halo circled the sun, according to these ancient observers. If true, this would correspond with the resurrection of our Lord. The Mediterranean. It is certainly interesting to observe how even ancient man was trying to explain away supernatural events with natural ones a hobby often taken up in our modern day. Returning to ancient Egypt, we can read from Pseudo Dionysius in the letter of Polycarp. They ask him, what have you to say about the solar eclipse which occurred when the Saviour was put on the cross? At the time, the two of us were in Heliopolis and we both witnessed an extraordinary phenomenon of the moon hiding the sun. At the time, that was out of season for their coming together. We saw the moon begin to hide the sun from the east, travel across to the other side of the sun and return on its path so that the hiding and the restoration of the light did not take place in the same direction but rather diametrically opposite directions. 
In 1457, Lorenzo Valle would ridicule the notion that Christ's crucifixion was caused by an eclipse. In our modern day, NASA and astronomers worldwide solidify Valle's position, pointing to the fact that no projection of the ancient past shows an eclipse of that time, and yet it happened. Ancient man was witnessing a global supernatural occurrence. If we jump to 52 AD, we read a Greek secular historian named Thalus, who recorded the following. On the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thalus, in the third book of his history calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. Julius Africanus, Chronologically, eight, chron Chronography, 18.1 The quote of one of Thallus's lost writings by Julius Africanus, who was writing about the event in 221 AD, Africanus also discusses another ancient who bore testimony to the darkness of Christ's crucifixion. Phlegion records that in time of Tiberius Caesar, a full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. It is clear that this is the one. But what have eclipses to do with an earthquake, rocks being breaking apart, resurrection of the dead and universal disturbance of nature? This very same Philagion is also quoted in Isabius Chronicle Chronological Canons. However, in the fourth year of the 202 Olympiad, the eclipse of the sun happened, greater and more excellent than any that had happened before it. At the sixth hour, day turned into dark night, so that the stars were seen in the sky, and an earthquake in Bithia. Bithynia toppled many buildings in the city of Nicaea. Picking on Pliny Pliny the Elder, also alive during the time of the crucifixion, yet scorned the very idea of Christian God, couldn't help but dip his own toes into discussions about powerful meaning behind eclipses and dim suns. Eclipses of the sun also take place, which are portentous and usually long, such as occurred when Caesar the Tegetier was slain and in the war against Antony. The, the sun dim, remained dim for almost a whole year. Pliny the Elder, Natural History, 230. One cannot help but wonder if Pliny was intentionally avoiding the elephant in the room, the, the case of Christ's death. He would not be the first to do so, but even, but he gives himself away when he says the words such as for Pliny has borne witness to other such supernatural solar darkenings, namely that of Jesus Christ. But some men were obstinate and being disbelievers in the Messiah, they would never acknowledge him. The Jewish historian Fla Flavius Josephus would share in Pliny's commentary on the dimming of the sun. But when those that were adversaries to you and to the Roman people abstained neither from cities nor temples and did not observe the agreement they had confirmed by oath. It was not only on account of our contest with them, but on account of all mankind in common, that we have taken vengeance on those who have been the authors of great justice towards men and of great wickedness towards the gods for the sake of which we suppose it was that the sun turned away his light from us as unwilling to view the hard crime they were guilty of in the case of Caesar. While at first bl blush to the Christian, it appears that Josephus was possibly referring to the darkness that followed Christ Jesus' crucifixion. However, recall that the Romans often viewed their own Caesars as deities, that they were elevated into godhood, and that Roman citizens were even made, even made sacrifices to them. In that context, then, it is clear that when Josephus talks about the Roman, to the Romans about great wickedness 
towards the god. He is referring to the betrayal of Julius Caesar, who was blatantly murdered in the Roman Senate by 60 Roman senators. Both he and Pliny the Elder attribute a long period of dim sun following Julius Caesar's death. All this said, early Christians, such as Tertullian, knew the historical record. Men such as he knew quite well what Roman records, what Romans kept records of strange uh, uh, astronomical events like Christ's crucifixion darkness, and Tertullian made sure he told it over their heads. And yet, nailed upon a cross, he exhibited many notable signs by which his death was distinguished from all others. At his own free will, he with a word diminished from his spirit, anticipating the executioner's work. In the same hour, too, the light of the day was withdrawn, when the sun at the very time was in his meridian blaze. Those who were not aware that this had been predicted by Christ no doubt thought it an eclipse. You yourselves have the account of the world portent still in your archives. Tertullian, Apologia 21. Later in the 4th century, Rufinus of Aquila would also call upon the Romans to check their logbooks for the period of darkness that was so conspicuously avoided by Pliny. Search your writings and you shall find that in Pilate's time, when Christ suffered, the sun was suddenly withdrawn and darkness followed. Indeed, the sun does get darkened during times of great heavenly pain, during, such, during times such as the crucifixion of the God-man, for example. And yet, conveniently enough, Pliny admits even commenting, the, even mentioning the event. Instead, he's happy to prattle about the virtue of turnips until his date with destiny on Mon Vesuvius discussing opinions based in the Mediterranean. It is interesting to note how in Greek mythology, after the Titan Prometheus, also known as the Logos, dared to bring fire down from heaven to mankind, he was crucified with nails in his feet and his outstretched hands, the same positioning as Jesus Christ. The ancient Titan was nailed straight into the rocks of Mount Caucasus, and he and as this transpired, the sky went dark, the earth shook, and there was thunder and lightning, wind, rising seas, and an overall convulsion of later, nature. Lo, streaming from the fatal tree, his all-atoning blood, tis he, Prometheus, and a god. Well might the sun in darkness hide, and veil his glories in, when God, the great Prometheus, died for man, for creature's sin. Prometheus bound. The above was a poem recorded over 400 years before Christ Jesus was even born. Such a thing as this is a prophetic typology in an old pagan religion and it's been known to happen before. We see this in several places, including in Norse mythology. While the crucifixion of Odin does not involve a moment of worldwide darkness, other elements of his torture do compared with what transpired with Jesus, such as his hanging on the world tree for nine days and his being pierced with a spear of Gunnir, just as Christ hung from the cross and was pierced by a spear of the centurion. Yet, while there might be some scrap of prefiguring truth in the ancient pagan religions, one could go to the other extreme and look at raw modern science. In 2012 it was reported that according to a geologic investigation of three rock core samples in the area, an enormous earthquake most certainly took place during the time of Jesus Christ would have been crucified. This seismic event was energetic enough to deform the sediments of the Ein Gedi Spa right next to the Dead Sea. Ireland there is, however, one final tale to share involving the worldwide darkness of, G of Christ's crucifixion. This is about a king named King Connor MacNessa. As the legend goes, this warrior king took a wound to the head that would eventually seal his fate. In a battle with, 
fellow warrior Connor's enemy used a sling to shoot a projectile straight into his skull. The object remained there, stuck in his head after the fight. Physicians could not remove it without killing him, and so there it stayed for seven long years. As long as King Connor didn't get overexcited, he would be fine. Yet if he overexerted himself, there was the chance that it would complicate his condition and die. But then came the day when King Connor Magnisa learned about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He learned this as it was happening in real time. So years had passed over when sitting mid silence like that of a tomb, a terror crept through him as sudden the noon light was blackened with gloom. One red flare of lightning blazed brightly, illumining the landscape around. One thunder pierce roared through the mountains and rumbled and crashed underground. He heard the rocks bursting asunder, the trees tearing up by the roots, and loud through the horrid confusion the howling of terrified brutes. From the halls of his tottering palace came screamings of terror and pain, and he saw crowding thickly around the ghosts of the foes he had slain. The light of that afternoon had gone away and everything went dark. Then there was lightning, thunder and earthquakes. There was mass panic and suddenly he bore witness to the ghosts of his enemies. This phenomenon simultaneously took place in Jerusalem shortly after Jesus had died on the cross. As Matthew 27, 52, 54 relates, the dead rose from their own tombs and walked the very streets. Blessed Anne, Catherine Anne Emmerich also relates a lot of the details of this frightening moment, though that is beyond the scopes of this article. Terrified King Connor calls for some counsel. And as soon as the sudden commotion that shuddered through nature had ceased, the king sent for Barak, his druid, and said, Tell me truly, O priest, what magical hearts have created this scene of wild terror and dread? What has blotted the blue sky above us and shaken the earth that we dread? Are the gods that we worship offended? What crime or what wrong has been done? What fault been committed in Erin? And how may their favour be won? What rites may avail to appease them? What gifts on their altars should smoke? Only say... And the offering demanded we lay by your consecrate oak. King Connor realizes that this is all being caused by some sort of supernatural act, and that he immediately attributes it to the pagan gods he is familiar with. He wants to appease them, and he asks his druid for advice on what to do. The solution, however, is beyond the king's ability. O king, said the white bearded druid, the truth unto me has been shown. There lives but one God, the Eternal. Far up in high heaven is his throne. He looked upon man with compassion and sent from his kingdom of light his son in the shape of a mortal to teach them and guide them aright. Near the time of your birth, O King Connor, the saviour of mankind was born. And since then, in the kingdoms far eastward, he taught, toiled and prayed, Till his morn. When wicked men seized him, fast bound him with nails to a cross, lanced his side, and that moment of gloom and confusion was earth's cry of dread when he died. O king, he was gracious and gentle, his heart was all pity and love, and for men he was ever beseeching the grace of his father above. He helped them, he healed them, he blessed them, he laboured that all might attain to the true God's high kingdom of glory where never comes sorrow or pain. When they rose in their pride and their folly, their hearts filled with merciless rage, that only the sight of his life blood fast poured from his heart could assuage. Yet while on the cross beams uplifted, his body racked, tortured and riven, 
He prayed not for justice or vengeance, but ask that his foes be forgiven. King Connor is briefly tutored about the character and quality of our Lord, and upon hearing of his unjust execution, he cannot help himself. His heart is stirred, he becomes enraged, and he works himself up at the terrible news. With a bound from a seat rose King Connor, the red flush of rage on his face. Fast he ran through the hall with his weapons and snatching his sword from its place. He rushed to the woods, striking wildly at boughs that dropped down with each blow, and he cried, Were I midst the vile rabble, I'd cleave them to earth even so. With the strokes of the High King of Erin, the worlds of my keen tempered sword, I would save from their horrible fury that mild and that merciful Lord. His frame shook and heaved with emotion. His brain ball leaped forth from his head and commending his soul to the Saviour, King Cogner Magnisa fell dead. Agitated and roused, the king runs into the woods and starts chopping at the tree branches, desperate to somehow make his way to the people who dared kill the Messiah. But in his anger, the projectile that was logged into his skull popped out, and he died. And he shortly died right there in the spot. The rage and frustration of King Connor Magnisa can also s- seem in the example of King Clovis four centuries later. Edward Gibbon, not a fan of Christianity, describes the mind of Clovis as being susceptible to transient fervour. Exacerbated by the pathetic tale of the passion and death of Christ, Clovis rose up in a fury and declared, If I had been there with my valiant Franks, I would have avenged him. Would that all of us have been there, King Clovis. It would have been a glorious to fight for such a cause.